going? Well, um, I think that I'm ready to do this study, this uh, expository study on 3rd John. So I've been studying this for the past couple of weeks. been reading 3rd John over and over and over again. And I've been looking at other studies, listening to sermons. I've been looking at cross-references for every verse. I've been looking at definitions for words. Um, and this is just a combination of all of that. I'm using parts from other people's studies and etc. Just because I think that they've said things really well. Plus I've added my own ideas and whatnot. So um, I still feel like I need more time. But it's taken enough time as it is. And I just want to get it done. And no study is going to be perfect, right? So um, anyway, uh, I guess I'll start with the prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father. Um, Lord in heaven, who created the earth and the heaven and everything that is in them, Lord. I just come before you and I thank you, God, um, for this opportunity, for this teaching, for this wonderful day. Um, I pray that you will bless those who watch this video, God, that you will give them from, some understanding from your word, and um, please help me to teach this clearly. Um, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, um, I'm just going to go through verse by verse and uh, talk about the cross references and, and whatever comes up. And uh, so I just want to start with some basic things just about overall this third epistle of John. Um, the author, as with Second John, um, it starts with the with um, the elder, and the elder is believed to be the Apostle John, because the epistles of John utilize much of the same language and ideas, and they all bear similarity to concepts and language to the Gospel of John. Uh, John was an apostle, but all respected men are elders. Peter also called himself an elder, though he was also an apostle as well. In 1 Peter 5, 1-5, um, John was likely an old man by this point, which also made him an elder. 1 Timothy 5.1. Um, he could have possibly used the, the name the elder because of persecution, maybe, you know, to kind of disguise himself. Um, all we can do is really speculate. We don't really know why he referred to himself as the elder. Um, but we do know that it was not because, uh, it, it was not because of a professional paid position like many so-called elders today. Um, <laughs> No, uh, nothing to do with that, okay? He wasn't getting a weekly paycheck or, you know, preaching in a Babel building every Sunday, okay? Um, the place and date of 3rd John. Ephesus is usually suggested as the location from which John wrote this epistle, as he was known to live there in the later years of his life. And estimation of the date of the writing varies widely, some placing it before the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 A.D., most, however, placing it around 90 to 95 A.D. Okay, and the person who this was written to, his name is Gaius. Uh, it was a common name at the time, uh, found in the Bible four other times, likely not the same person. In Acts 19.29, uh, the Gaius there was a Macedonian man. Acts 20.40, he was from Derby. In Romans 16.23 and 1 Corinthians 1.14, uh, the Gaius mentioned those times was from Corinth. Um, but the Gaius in Romans 16.23 and 3 John share a common godly characteristic that they are both hospitable. Okay, so I'll start off the, now with the first verse in 3 John. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Okay, again, it starts off with the elder. We know it's John because of um, similarities between these epistles and between the Gospel of John. But um, an interesting note is that it doesn't start off with Pastor John. In fact, we don't see that idea anywhere in the Bible with anyone taking the title of Pastor or, you know, Pastor so and so, Pastor Paul, Pastor Timothy. Uh, Pastor Peter, or Elder, you know, Elder Paul, Elder John. We don't see that anywhere in the Bible. So why is that so common today for these hirelings to call themselves Pastor so-and-so? 
That is not a concept that is found in Scripture. All throughout the Scripture is never found once. Okay? So, so why would they start doing that? Um, well, there was a point in history when that started, but that would be for another study. <laughs> um, actually, uh, in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the beloved disciple. And uh, in 1 John, his first epistle, he's anonymous. Uh, second and third John, he, he refers to himself as the elder, and in Revelation, um, he refers to himself as his servant John, servant of the Lord, and also a brother. Um, so that's something common that we see um, from the disciples, the apostles, that you know they they refer to themselves as servant of the Lord and as brethren, but never as pastor so and so. Um, you know, and he doesn't refer to himself as the last living foundational apostle, which he was at this point. Probably all the other apostles were dead. He was the only living one, and he was very old at this time. So, moving along here, it's the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. Um, so, that word beloved is a term of endearment. Um, it means dearly loved, and it is a characteristic of John's letters. It's repeated four times in this epistle. Um, Paul, Peter, John, James, Jude, all referred to brethren as beloved. Um, believers are beloved of God. Romans 1 7 says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is beloved. Ephesians 1 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the Beloved Son of his Father. Mark 1.11 says, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this term, Beloved, it's really, you know, it's dearly loved. This is a love from, you know, the Father, uh, God, to, to the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a, um, how um, it's how brethren need to love each other as well, uh, you know. So this is a really strong love that that is shared shared between you know those who are saved, the brethren, and between the Lord and His Son, and the Lord and us. Um, so you know, brethren should love themselves, love each other more even than. Uh, than their own family, you know, if they're lost. Uh, anyways, so, so unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So what does it mean to love in the truth? Um, well, first of all, love and truth are found together often in John's epistles. That's another characteristic or similarity that we see in the epistles. And um, well, what does it mean to love in the truth? Well. 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that reminds me of a verse, Matthew 15.8, that says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So this is a love from the heart. It's not a superficial love. Okay, um, It's not just like these Bible buildings on Sunday mornings where they go around and they do the handshake and, you know, people smile at each other and they compliment each other. And then and then outside uh, the building called a church, they, they want nothing to do with you, you know. Uh, that's, not, that's not real love. That's just an illusion. It's a deception. It's appearance of love. And um, to love in the truth means a truth that is governed by love. Um, or I mean a love that is governed by the truth I said that backwards Sorry. it's a love that is governed by the truth the truth is God it's uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit it's uh, God's Word the Holy One of Israel um, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that is the truth so this is a love we should love as He loves the best that we can Love as he tells us to love from his word. That's what it means to love in the truth. And, uh, you know, it's just a real love for Gaius from John.
in this epistle. So that's all I got to say about the first verse. So let's move on to verse 2 and 3 John. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Okay, from this verse, we see that John wishes above all things that Gaius may prosper in his health as he is prospering in his soul, as his soul prospereth. And, uh, you know, John wishes above all things, even above his own profiting, he, he wishes that Gaius would profit. And that's how we need to be as Christians. We need to seek another man's wealth. As 1 Corinthians 10.24 says, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And wealth doesn't just mean money. Uh, it means the condition of being happy and prosperous and spiritual well-being. That's what wealth means in this context. So, we need to seek other men's wealth, not, not our own. Um... We need to look on the things of others. You know, Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. So, uh, John was certainly doing that. And we need to realize that prospering of the soul comes first. Um, Gaius' soul prospered because he was in Christ. His sins were forgiven. He was growing in the Lord. Um, good health and prosperity is not guaranteed either in the atonement or by a right relationship with God. Physical health is not always the Lord's will. Okay, all we need to do is look at the book of Job. And uh, we can see that also 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay, um... So, Paul got a thorn in the flesh. He had some kind of uh, illness, you know, something that was causing him pain. And he asked the Lord twice to, to take it from him, but the Lord said that his grace is sufficient. So, uh, it is up to God whether to allow the wicked or godly to prosper, be poor, to be healthy, or to be sick and persecuted. Ecclesiastes 8.14 says, There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. We can certainly pray for God to prosper those who are committed believers, but we also are to ask everything according to the will of God. We do not demand, declare, summon, or invoke God. As the charismatic faith healer, heretics do. That is sorcery. Okay. Verse number three. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. John's greatest joy is to see those who are his spiritual children walking in the truth of the word. Jesus Christ and his teaching is taught by the apostles. His joy was not in their spiritual gifts and signs and wonders and how big churches their churches were or how much money they collected, but in their adherence to the truths they were taught. This is also God's greatest joy. God blesses us and is pleased with us based on our obedience to his word. Um, John showed, showed a characteristic of charity here, 1 Corinthians 13.6 says, Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. And that is certainly what John rejoiced in. He rejoiced that his children, that that Gaius was walking in the truth. Um, to walk in the truth means to walk in a way that is real and genuine without any phoniness or concealment, but more importantly, to walk according to the truth of the word of God and keeping his commandments. Notice that John emphasized the word truth four times in the first four verses. Today, the emphasis in churches is on everything, uh, but making sure that we are walking 
and the truth, rather than bringing people to maturity in churches. The leadership keeps them infants by feeding them the milk of stories, myths, pop psychology, entertainment, and new ideas beyond what is written. They teach them not to judge, not to discern, not to test by the word of God, not to even use their minds for fear they may become critical and miss out on the move of God. But what God requires is entirely different. He requires discernment. And the only way to get discernment is to become mature in the faith. The only way to become mature in the faith is to know Jesus Christ, his word, and obey his commandments. Okay. Verse number four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. So, here John is uh, saying that, you know, Gaius is one of his children. This would be like a spiritual child. Paul says this a lot, uh, and it's often used in John's writings. 1 Corinthians 4.14 says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. This is Paul talking to those, his spiritual children. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though you, yet you have ten thousand instructors, instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers, for in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Um, and we should, we should rejoice if we lead someone to the Lord, because there is going to be a crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So a lot of people call this also the soul winner's crown. Um, I believe it means that we'll be rewarded for, for leading people to the Lord in heaven. Um, so... Now, verse number 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Um, okay, well, faithfully, faithful means showing true and constant support or loyalty. And the Bible has a lot to say about being faithful. But Luke 16.10, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Um, and 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. Gaius was faithful. Um, so that is a, definitely a godly characteristic. Um, now it says that, Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. What does it mean to strangers? These strangers are traveling evangelists. These are people who wandered around spreading the gospel and... They didn't, you know, they didn't have money or, or anything with them, really. So when they came through, they would get support from the brethren. And Gaius took them in and, you know, maybe fed them, gave them clothes, whatever they needed. Um, and Hebrews 13.2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And uh, back in Genesis, the Lord came to Abram with uh, three angels, and and um, Abram and his wife, you know, fed them. Uh, so that's something that we need to remember to entertain strangers. Um, you know, in this context, it's talking about you know traveling evangelists, talking about brethren, but. We need to be hospitable to everybody, really. Um, it's about hospitality, and that's how we need to be as God's children. Um, so I'll move on to verse number 6. Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Um, so says, have borne witness of thy charity. So Gaius had charity because um, he was faithful and hospitable. And it says before the church. And uh, that's just a huge topic talking about the church. This is a verse where it's used. But I will say that the, the word church has many uses throughout the Bible. Um, it could be talking about the universal people of God. Um, it could be a local congregation of believers. It could be the people of Israel collectively or the people of God in a region. Um, but it's never a building. It's, 
there were never buildings called churches for hundreds of years after um, all of this was written. So, I think in this context we're talking about a local congregation of believers. And there are some that deny that, that church, the church could ever mean a universal people of God, but that's just denying scripture. Because Jesus says um, that he will build his church singular, and it's meaning the body of Christ. There is only one body of Christ, and there's a lot of false teachers out there too that will say, well, this building called a church is a body of Christ, and this building called a church is another body of Christ, but there's only one body of Christ. There's one head of the church, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's talking universally. Anyway, um, When it says bring them forward, it means in that day Christian travelers in general and itinerant ministries, ministers in particular were greatly dependent upon the hospitality of other Christians. John knew that when Christians assist those who contend for the truth, they become fellow workers for the truth. The reward for, for these support people is the same as those who are out on the front lines. 1 Samuel 30, 21-25 shows this principle. For the spoils are distributed equally among those who fought for those who supported. King David understood the supply lines were just as vital as the soldiers, and God would, would reward both soldiers and supporters properly and generously. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Jesus promised that even the help offered in a cup of cold water to one of his children would not be forgotten when God brings his reward, Matthew 10, 42. Um, this also explains why John would pray for the prosperity of Gaius. He used his resources in a godly way, being a blessing to others. If God blessed him with more, others would be blessed more also. So these strangers bore witness of uh, Gaius' charity before the church, so... These people were traveling, spreading the gospel, and they came to an area where Gaius was, and Gaius took them in and fed them and helped them and gave them, or whatever, to, to continue, and they moved along, and, you know, they came to Ephesus, where, where John is, and they're saying, you know, yeah, I was in this other place, Rome or wherever, and, you know, there's a man named Gaius and, you know, brother, you know, and he helped us and took us in, so they're, they're, tes they're testifying of his deeds to the church in Ephesus saying, you know, all the good things that he did and kind of like bragging on him. So uh, that's that's how this happened. That's the way that I look at this. Um, verse number seven, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. And um, let's see here. Well, these, miss these missionaries or these traveling evangelists, whatever, they were, they did it for his name's sake, for the Lord's name's sake, not for their own name or for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the gospel. Um, and when it says taking nothing from the Gentiles, the ancient world of the early church was filled with the missionaries and preachers of various religions, and they often supported themselves by taking offerings from the general public. But John said that these Christian missionaries should take nothing from the Gentiles, non-Christians. Instead of soliciting funds from the general public, they were to look to the support of fellow Christians. Um, I want to mention a, a couple verses or passages about taking funds. 1 Corinthians 9.12 says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather nevertheless we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So the Apostle Paul, he didn't take money. Um, he was the tent maker. He worked hard to make his own money. He didn't want to take money for, for, for preaching uh, because he said it would be a hindrance to the gospel. And then obviously today all these, these false uh, churches, uh, these hirelings, they have no problem taking a paycheck or taking offerings from people, taking tithing, which isn't taught in the Bible. Um... They don't see it as a hindrance to gospel. They don't look at it the same as Paul does, which we are supposed to. We're supposed to follow Paul as he followed Christ. But 
you know, they just they just want to ignore all that. They just want the money. They're in it for the greed, for the money. Um, if they weren't getting paid to do it, they wouldn't be doing it. And they're not helping the gospel at all. So, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, 14 and 19. And it's more of the same thing. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 through 19. Um... Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. See, taking money, taking things from them would be a burden. For I seek not yours, not your money, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He's saying that, you know, he should be laying up money and stuff to give to them, to be a blessing to them, not to be taking things from them. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Be it so, I did not burden you, nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent to you? And the answer will be no. 18. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, thank ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God and Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. Paul did not take money from people, and we should not either, brethren. If people want to give money or as a gift or they want to help, that's fine. But to ask for it or to ask for offerings or whatever, no, that should not be done. Um, that's extortion. And uh, John is commending, you know, these uh, evangelists, these traveling evangelists, for for not taking money from from the Gentiles. So anyway, move on. Verse eight: We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And we see this in Scripture: receiving one another. Romans 15, 7 says, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And uh, we know even Jesus was ministered to in Luke 8, 1 through 3. John 13, 20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Okay? We need to make sure that we receive others in Christ, and that means to to bring them in, to help them with whatever their needs are, you know, pray for them, whatever we can do for them. Now I want to go to Matthew 25, verse 31, and read, start reading the parable of the sheep and the goats. So Matthew 25, verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the sheep shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set up the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king come, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch, Inasmuch as ye gave, as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Okay, so it doesn't mean that they were saved because they 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 gave food and drank to people who were in need, but that is just a characteristic of someone who is saved that they will do those things, that they will help the brethren. Um. So we need to remember that you know, that we need to receive the brethren. And uh, if we do that, if we if we help them and feed them or give them whatever their needs are, then we are doing it to the Lord. And he will remember that. And it will be a blessing. And, okay, so I'll go on to verse 9 now. 
I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. So he was just uh, saying, John was just saying to Gaius that we need to receive the brethren. Um, you know, receive the traveling missionaries and, or, you know, the traveling evangelists. And here we, here we go, seeing that Diotrephes receiveth not John, um, or the brethren. Um, you know, I can do a whole study on Diotrephes, which I hopefully will in the future. But I don't want to stick on this a whole lot, but there are some things I'll say about it. Um, first of all, it's incredible to think that Diotrephes would not have fellowship with one of our Lord's own apostles. How much could he have learned from John? But Jesus was not preeminent in his life, therefore he could afford to treat the eighth apostle this way. Why did he reject John? Because John challenged his right to be a dictator in the church. John was a threat to him. John knew the truth about him and was willing to make it known. Satan was at work in the church because Diotrephes was operating on the basis of pride and self-glorification, two of the devil's chief tools. You know, John had the light of the Lord to make Diotrephes' evil deeds manifest. Um, Christ is to have the preeminence in the church and preeminence means surpassing all others and super superiority uh, Colossians 1.18 says and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence and this is talking of the Lord Jesus Christ he is to have the superiority in the church and the superiority in our lives um the Bible speaks against people trying to lord over the flock, which is what Diotrephes was trying to do. He was a dictator in this local congregation. 1 Peter 5, 1-3 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom I am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. Okay, so we are not to dictate over other believers. You know, teach them, help them, guide them, but we don't rule over them. We don't tell them, you know, we don't control them. We don't try to control them. Um, I want to go to Matthew 20. Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Okay. Matthew 20, 20 through, eight, 20 through 28. says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in, the, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and to sit on the left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them, for whom is prepared, for whom it is prepared of my Father. And then... The ten heard it. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called unto him and said, uh, "Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto." but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, he says here that uh, it's not going to be like as it is in the world, where the greatest exercise of authority and dominion over everyone else. In the kingdom of heaven, whoever will be greatest will be the least among you. And whoever is the greatest will be a servant, as the Lord is as he was when he came. So that's completely the opposite of what Diotrephes is here. He is, he is trying to have dominion, and uh, he wants the preeminence instead of letting the Lord have the preeminence. 
So, verse number 10, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he receive, uh, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So John entertained the thought of coming in person to deal with the problem like a man, which is something that I think is missing today. Many professing Christians are cowards. They want to ignore the issues or have someone else deal with them. They do not have Holy Ghost boldness. They reject the biblical commands from God to reprove the works of darkness or defend the faith. Instead, they are instead more comfortable with adhering to false doctrines such as judge not. Paul would have done the same. Um, confronting someone face to face. 2 Corinthians 13.2 says, I told you therefore and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which hither to four have sin, with heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again I will not spare. And Galatians 2.11 says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Now to prate means to talk foolishly or tediously about something. I think that this is pretty much it's bearing false witness. Um... Now, 1 Peter 3.16 says, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So, you know, if we are walking in the truth, living as we are to live for the Lord, then when others speak evil of us, as Diotrephes is speaking of John, then it is going to be a shame to them. Um, because they can be exposed that, you know, what they are doing is wrong. Um, if in pride you want the preeminence, you will criticize anyone who may be a competitor in order to keep them from gaining more respect than you have. Um, now I wanted, I wanted to mention a few verses, how a Christian is commanded to deal with a man such as Diotrephes by Scripture. Um, Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And Romans 16.17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. So we are to reprove them, to mark them, and avoid them. Um, I want to go back to the parable of the sheep and the goats. In Matthew 25. Matthew 25. <clears throat> Verse 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So he says, he's talking about people who didn't receive the brethren. Um, they didn't feed anyone. Or that, This is how Diotrephes was. Um, Whoever would receive the brethren, he would cast them out of the church. So this man was certainly evil. And people like Diotrephes will always have their enthusiastic followers because they, because many sincere but immature and untaught believers prefer to follow such leaders. It made no difference whether or not a person knew and loved the Lord. What mattered was whether they knew and bowed to Diotrephes. And i got to get a drink really quick. And this is what we got here in the modern church system today. All these hirelings, they are all diatrophies. Um, they want to lord it over the flock. Um, you know, these so-called pastors, they are CEOs. They are certainly, you know, in control. Um, it's not of God whatsoever, so... Verse 11, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, 
but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now I have to think here that he is talking about Diotrephes. He is saying that Diotrephes does evil and he has not seen God. So Diotrephes is not even a saved man. Um, you know, and this is kind of a test for who's saved and who isn't. You know, the Bible gives us these so to help us who are saved to know. Um, Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So not only are we told not to follow that which is evil, but to abhor that which is evil. We should, uh, abhor means to regard with disgust or hatred. It's like a deep hatred. Um, and this is, this has some similarities to 1 John. Um, 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So here it's talking about whosoever sinneth or doeth evil um, hath not seen him or known him. So that's just like verse 11 in 3 John that says, He that doeth evil hath not seen God. Mm. So we see that twice there. Seen, we see that similarity in these epistles. Um, in verse 10 also, And this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Um, so I have to think that he's speaking of Diotrephes here, that he is not saved, and that he is a bad example. He is, you know, he's doing evil. And then John's next going to give um, a good example, you know, follow that which is good. Um, verse 12, Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. And a lot of people think that Demetrius is the one who is delivering this letter from John to Gaius. And I just want to mention a couple other people who specifically are mentioned to have a good report. Um, Cornelius in Acts 10.22 has a good report, and Ananias in Acts 22.12. In Acts 22, um, the Bible says that a bishop must have a good report. 1 Timothy 3.7 Moreover, he must have good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And we have a good report with God that is obtained by faith. Hebrews 11.2 says, For by it the elders obtained good report by faith. They obtained a good report with God. And we are told in Scripture to think of things with good report. And Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true... Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, thank on these things. So, so here John is, you know, he's commending Demetrius. He's saying, here's a good example for you to follow, Gaius. And Gaius, you know, himself is a good example to follow. He was walking in the truth, he was hospitable and all these things. But we always need an example to follow, you know, and our ultimate example is Jesus. But, you know, we should commend brethren, too, who are, who are doing good, walking in the Lord as well. And go to verse 13. I have many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. Um, we can sympathize with John's preference to personal face-to-face -face communication rather than writing than the writing of letters. Yet we are thankful that John was forced to write so that we have the record of this letter of John, of 3 John. And verse 14, But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet thee friends by name. Um, in addition to a familiar blessing of peace upon Gaius, John also reminded him and us of the common ties of Christians. Even if they are separated by miles, they are still friends in Jesus, and appropriately 
they should greet one another. Uh, this letter is uh, this this is a letter about contention and conflict. Yet John appropriately ends the letter with a desire and expectation for peace. As Christians, we can and should have a sense of peace even in the midst of difficult times. Christians have the resources in Jesus Christ to have peace even in unsettled seasons. Now I just want to leave you with some practical things to get from this uh, third epistle of John. Um, like, what is a love that is governed by the truth? I want to give some of the most loving things that you can do as a Christian. Uh, the most loving thing that you can do for a non-believer is to preach the gospel to them, thereby telling them the truth. The most loving thing that you can do for a believer is to teach them the truth, to disciple them, to help them grow to maturity in Christ so that they will be able to know the difference between good and evil, as Hebrews 5.14 states, and not be blown about by every wind of doctrine. And the most loving thing that you can do for a heretic is to tell them the truth, rebuke them, and reject them if they are unrepentant. Naming heretics accomplishes two things. It protects the church against wolves who secretly introduce heresies, and it rebukes and rejects heretics so that they might possibly be ashamed and return to orthodoxy. There is no way any heretic can be schmoozed back to orthodoxy. They must be confronted with the truth and love with their false teachings, and if they do not repent and stop doing what they are doing, they are to be thrown out of the church, no longer to be called our brothers in the Lord. This is what John was, talk was about to do with Diotrephes. We are to call attention to the de deeds and of heretics and warn the church to stay away from them. And uh, I just want to run down a list of things that I got from this third epistle of John um, to help us walk in the truth, things that we should remember to do, um, examples from this epistle. We need to look on the things of others, you know, even more importantly than our own needs, our own things. We need to pray for, for others and help them in whatever way that we can. Look on the things of others, even strangers, uh, you no know, brethren that we might not not have known for very long at all. Um, we need to receive them, be hospitable to them. We need to put on charity. We need to rejoice in the truth. We need to be faithful in all things. We need to commend the brethren. We need to reprove the works of darkness. We need to let Christ have the preeminence in our lives and remember that he has preeminence in the church and uh, never lord over anyone, never dictate over anyone, but instead be servants. If possible, deal with the situation face to face, desire fellowship, and think on these things. And uh, that's about all I got. So I hope that you learned something from the study of Third John. I learned a lot. And uh, now I want to move on to studying something else. So <laughs> thank you for watching. God bless. Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.